and uh, my name is Sahil Kaneja and I'm one of the banking advisors with RBC's newcomer specialist team here in St. John's. RBC has been a proud supporter of ANC and the annual diversity summit for many years now and we believe strongly in all the good things ANC is doing. As we strive for organizational excellence for diversity and inclusion, we are delighted to have the associations of new Canadians, our, our trusted friends and allies. At RBC, we, all, we are also dedicated in uniting the people through music and art with our RBC's emerging artists and RBC's ex-music programs. <clears throat> we see firsthand how live music experiences have the power to connect and inspire change. Newcomer entertainers bring such rich cultures and beauty and creativity to NL Music Industry, and we are proud sponsors of all the entertainment provided today. Our first group is St. John's Micmac Women's Circle. This group is open to all women, trans women, and self-identifying women in St. John's who meet and share and learn about the Micmac culture. They are here with us today, and they'll share some original songs and music with us from their culture. And please give a warm welcome to the St. John's Mi'kmaq Woman Culture. Gwei, Deloise, Lorenda, Boeck, Webeg. My name is Lorenda Wei. Hi means uh, Gwei. So, uh, Gwei, everybody. Today, we're going to sing a few songs for you and drum for you. Our, our teachings tell us that it's the quality of the voice that counts. It's singing from your heart. And we're going to have our two little ones here. Uh, Layla is three and Kai is four. And they're going to accompany us. Thank you. Our first song is going to be the friendship song. In Mi'kmaq communities, people sing this song in friendship. It is a chant. It is not uh, a song uh, with words. Uh, we sometimes use it for round dancing. So, uh, Gloria, where are you? <laughs> She's going to lead us in a friendship song. song is the healing song. In today's world, a lot of people are struggling with physical, mental, emotional, and other issues. Mother Earth is also struggling. So this song is a prayer for all who need it. Virginia. Virginia is going to lead us in this song.
remember how to do it. Our next song is a strong women's song. Indigenous women who were incarcerated in Kingston Prison used to sing this song so that they would give strength to each other as they were in solitary confinement. Uh, we will have Michelle lead this song. Okay, guys, me again. <laughs> Sorry about that. This was um, actually the strong man song. Uh, we sing that to balance out the strong woman's song. So now we're going to do the strong woman's song. Uh, Michelle?
Our drums are very important to us. We honor them. Uh, we honor the animal who gave his life for the height of our drum and the trees in the forest that gave us the wood parts of our drum. We believe that the spirit of the animal is in our drum and we honor it with the drum song. And uh, we're going to have Bev do this, lead this song. Thank you. sing our songs in four rounds. Four means uh, the four directions and sometimes we do seven rounds but normally we stay at four. Uh, seven rounds would be the four directions, the sky above, mother earth below and the, the spirit within. So our next song is kind of going to start off a little bit slower and it's going to move up to be a bit faster and it's the water song. Everything on mother earth needs water to survive. Water is life. So in the Mi'kmaq culture, um, water protectors are the women. So uh, we, pers we always make sure to take care of our waters. And we ask that everybody should take care of our waters because if we want to live on this planet, we have to make sure we have clean water. So our next song is the water song. And Melinda will be leading this one. Thank you.
Dalio. It was a pleasure to entertain for you. So thank you folks. I hope you're all stocked up on your muffins and fruit and coffee. Uh, next up, we are going to have our employment equity panel discussion. Now this morning's panel has been sponsored by McGinnis Cooper. Thank you, McGinnis Cooper. So this panel is about employment equity. Equity is defined as fairness and justice. The term differs from equality and that it means recognizing that we do not all start from the same place and must acknowledge and adjust these imbalances. Uh, according to the Canadian Human Rights Commission, the Employment Equity Act, which came into effect in 1986, helps ensure that all Canadians have the same access to the labor market. The act also requires employees, employers, sorry, to take action to provide the complete representation of members of four designated groups within their organizations. Those groups are women and women identifying individuals, indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, and members of racialized groups. The act requires employers to investigate, identify, and take concrete action to correct the conditions of employment uh, disadvantage for these designated groups. This legislation, in tandem with the Accessible Canada Act of 2018, has sparked inclusion campaigns and initiatives within the federal government and beyond, such as the anti-racism strategy, the formation of a 2SLGBTQI plus secretariat, and gender mainstreaming through the Gender-Based Analysis Program, GBA. This panel, and our following panel, uh, is moderated by Megan Felt. And I'm going to go ahead and list our panelists. And as I list you, if you could please come up and take a seat on our lovely yellow couches. So we have Khalid Ahari from the ANC. Khalid? We have Alex Gibson from Pentagon. Alex. <laughs> we have Paula Keeley from Oish. Oish. Ocean's Choice International, excuse me. <laughs> we have Vongai Makansa from RBC. Lauren Davies from Cisco. And Nicole Hall from Tim Hortons. Uh, Megan Felt is our partner with McKinnis Cooper. Hello, test. There okay. you go. Thank Hi, you. Everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Felt, uh, immigration lawyer and partner with Megan's Cooper Law Firm. It's really, I'm really happy to be here today and moderate this panel. I'm not going to introduce you all because it would take uh, quite a while and we, don't, we have limited time. So I'm going to get into some questions. Um, our discussion today is going to be on uh, the employer equity and uh, in particular the employer, employer equity or employment equity act uh, and just some of the conditions or some of the things that have been imposed under that act. Um, two kind of overarching concepts, uh, uh, equality and equity, are discussed in this act. And these two, these two definitions, although they sound quite similar, they actually have quite different concepts, right? So uh, equality is a notion that all individuals or groups of individuals uh, should have access to the same opportunities or, or, or resources, whereas equality uh, uh, or the, the concept of equality, you know, recognizes that not everyone starts in the same playing field. So uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, re sometimes, sometimes there have to be in, uh, adjustments to imbalances to make sure that people do um, or are on the same, same level of playing field. So I'm going to get right into some questions here today. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to have everyone answer every single question. So if you guys could just uh, chime in and uh, you feel like there's a question that you feel would be appropriate for you and your organization to respond to, we'd really appreciate it. And then we'll just kind of go with the natural flow of, uh, of the panel. So my first question is, um, according to the Human Rights Commission, it is the employer's responsibility to develop and implement an employment equity program in consultation and collaboration with employee representatives. How, how have your organizations worked to develop your employment equity programs? Does anyone want to start? <laughs> You're gonna need. We're gonna need to pass around some, some. Uh, yeah, some of your. Maybe. Yeah. We'll. we'll. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, so, oh, yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, in our work with the Association for, uh, for New Canadians, um, we have an organic uh, EDI system, if you would like to call it like that. Uh, because we are all diverse, uh, we come from different backgrounds, uh, we have uh, people uh, from indigenous backgrounds also. Uh, we have, so it's, it's something organic within our organization, but to improve that situation, we even worked recently on uh, forming a committee for uh, uh, employment uh, uh, diversity. And, uh, and it's, it's been something that we see uh, every day in our work that wherever you are from, you are included, you are welcome in, in the workplace. All right, I'll focus maybe on the recruitment and more specifically the pipeline. Uh, so being a newcomer, being a new Canadian especially, or of, of many of those equitable groups, I often find the network might not be there from an employment perspective than a standard maybe person would. So we at Pentagon have tried to really tap into that and create those networks. So we aren't the experts and I don't want to be, well I want to be, but I know I won't ever be the most smart in the room when it comes to looking at those kind of things. So we've partnered with ANC, we've partnered with Trades and L and the Indigenous Skilled Trade Office, the Office to Advance Women Apprentice, and we have monthly events with those groups to really just talk about their candidates, their clients, uh, barriers, and it's really a client approach. It's one by one discussions on how to eliminate those barriers, having those conversations, and then bringing them up, bringing them into our talent pool pipeline, interviewing, and then hopefully success follows, which it often does. Mm, that's great. Does anyone else want to share any of their, uh, any of the things that they're doing to um, uh, you know, to uh, advance equity programs in their, within the organizations? I can chime in. Sure, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. I'm not even sure what time of day it is. Um, <laughs> when we came out here, I was hoping there'd be a table to hide behind, but there isn't. Um, so Alex just spoke to some of the stuff that they do with regards to recruitment, and so I'll speak to the retention piece. I work at RBC. Um, so one of the things that we've done well is the development of employee resource groups that cascade from a national level to uh, regional right down to provincial. Um, so I, I'll outline some of the ones that we, we have. So we've got the Atlantic Pride ERG and their focus is creating and maintaining a positive uh, sustainable work environment. Uh, to all individuals inclusive of the LGBTQ um, community. We've also got a in Atlantic Women's ERG. It's an opportunity for women to get together, not just women, but even men as, as allies of women to help uh, promote networking, learning about opportunities of career growth and development and helping talented women retain and, uh, and climb up the career ladder. We've got the Atlantic Mosaic ERG, and their mission is to foster a culture of diversity and inclusion by enabling employees of minority groups through investment in their personal development. We've got the Royal Eagles Atlantic ERG, uh, a group for Indigenous and non-Indigenous non employees to work together to raise awareness and support an Indigenous culture within, within RBC. We've got REACH, which stands for the Royal Bank Employees Ability Career Heart and their mission is to improve the experience of employees with disabilities, eliminating stigma and driving inclusion. I think that's one ERG that uh, there, was a question, there was a couple of questions that came out with regards to how um, to include people with disabilities, whether you can see them or, or they're not visible. And I think at RBC, I can, I can say that's been a bit of a challenge that they are definitely always working through because sometimes those disabilities are not visible. And those disabilities are only known when people um, self-identify. So working with those individuals that fall into those category is an opportunity to know where are the gaps and what is it that we can do to improve in those areas. And the last ERG that I'll highlight is the Atlantic Black Action Committee. And that mission, their mission is to increase engagement of black employees across Atlantic to work and enhance executive and execute national office initiatives 
to increase RBC's presence in the black community. So just going back to your question on how we can do that is engaging the employees, providing them platforms to bring back information to the organization on what can be done to help and improve their, their working conditions and environments. Thank you. Yeah, great. That's, thank you so much for that. <clears throat> and you mentioned challenges, so, uh, which leads us into our next question. You know, so what are some of the challenges that you as, uh, I guess most of you are employers on this panel, uh, are experiencing with the uh, integration of uh, people within these, these groups or you know, newcomers into the, the Canadian labor market? What are some of the challenges you guys are facing? Um, I'll jump in. I can jump in. Yep. Uh, Paula Kiley from Ocean Choice. My face doesn't normally look like this yeah. every day. I had surgery on Tuesday, so you'll pardon the, the, uh, the look I have going you look on beautiful. here. beautiful. <laughs> Beauty's from within anyway, and I think I'm number 10. Anyway, <laughs> back to the question. For, um, I work in the fishing industry. We have um, uh, lots of partners with the indigenous groups. I'm very proud of that. Um, I guess from our perspective, the challenge um, is um, the regulations mm -hmm. and uh, the groups that regulate and certify um, the people who are already trained all over the world and when they come to Canada to work in Canada, they don't necessarily meet the Canadian standards. Mm -hmm. um, we, we face that in the healthcare, we all hear a doctor in, you know, you, in China is the same as a doctor in the body is the same in Canada as they are. So we face that challenge. Um, with several um, industries or several um, organizations. So what we've done is taken upon ourselves, for instance, Transport Canada. You can be a chief medical or marine engineer somewhere else and you don't qualify in Canada. Yeah. So we've taken upon ourselves to try and collaborate in partnership with, with government and regulatory people in different uh, divisions, either it be in our engineering, our mechanical, um, so that we can make sure, even our refrigeration people, that we can try and work with them, work with the regulators, work with the individuals who we are bringing in and immigrating into Canada so we can help them get certified through various processes with them and that they recognize the training that they did in another country, mm -hmm. which is really re relevant to what they've done here. Most times very equivalent too. That's one of the largest challenges as an immigration lawyer. I see that all the time. You know, we have people who are ready and able and willing, but the licensing is a huge barrier. Whether it's for professional or whether it's a, it could anything from a you know truck driver to you know doctor, to nurses, to engineers, whatever the case may be. So um, uh, in every different you know industry, we're facing that challenge. I think that's a really great point and a really great um, recommendation or option is for the employers to actually participate and to try to. Uh, remove those barriers. I think that's an excellent, um, an excellent point. Um, any, anyone else? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to chime in as well. Yeah. Very similar in our industry. My name is Loren, and I work with Cisco, which is a global food distribution company. So we have the exact same challenges. We have food that needs to move around. It's a need. It's not a want. And we have a lot of fantastic truck drivers that can drive in cities like Tokyo and you know, they, they don't have the credentials to drive in St. John's, Newfoundland. So what we do is we also do in-house training. So we will partner with them and we'll give them two solid years of training so they can get their credentials, they can have a mentor on site. Um, they, we also help them during that process with their PR and everything. So it's whole health. It's not just career health, it's whole health. And one of the things that really helps us in identifying where people are is we do stay interviews with them throughout their career. So we meet with them and we ask them professionally and personally, what would make you stay with the company um, and how can we partner with you to get you where you need to be? So credential recognition is huge. I can say something a little bit more basic because I'm with Tim Hortons, my, I'm Nicole. Um, the biggest challenge for us when we had uh, newcomers come to Canada was actually our currency. They didn't understand what a loonie or a toonie was or even what it looked like because they knew it was a dollar, two dollars, but our lingo, it's a loonie or a toonie and like nickels and dimes. So like we quickly realized that like we were having cash shortages because we didn't catch on at first to how, how they didn't understand our, like our, our lingo when it came to our money. 
Um, and with our equipment and stuff as well, like Tim Hortons, everybody knows double double and, and regular and stuff. But we also have like equipment that we use, like a, a hopper, and that's what fills our donuts. And like to explain the equipment that we had to use, um, we had to quickly catch on and make sure that we educated and taught them everything that um, we thought was basic. And then we just made sure that um, it was communicated properly to everybody else once we quickly learned that uh, we, we missed a step at the beginning, but they brought it to our attention. So it, it's basic, but it's right at, the, right at the level that they need to know because that's part of their job. Their main job is handling cash and stuff. So That's great. And Khalid? Yeah, yeah so uh, I work with, uh, with the Employment Services at the Association for New Canadians, and I f feel that what, all what you said is really important for new Canadians. Um, and I also can add something about language because language is a sometimes a challenge um, um, so it's a challenge if uh, if the newcomer doesn't speak any English but at the same time when um, the newcomer speaks some English uh, there's something called the silencing of ESL speakers in, uh, in employment uh, where um, usually uh, uh, speakers uh, of, uh, of English as a second language don't get much to say in, in meetings uh, so language is a, is a big barrier for many newcomers. Uh, now, good enough for the Association for New Canadians is that we came up with some solutions for these things. So we came up with recently with the idea of having language coaches who can go to businesses and work with uh, newcomers in their businesses to support them to learn the language of that business specifically, not just like the general English, uh, so they can be able to uh, be more productive. Uh, we also uh, thought of like all the other challenges and that's why we, we started uh, recently uh, an employment training center where uh, um, newcomers can come to us and uh, be trained for the work culture in, in Canada and in Newfoundland and Labrador. That's great. That's a great discussion. So I'm going to move on to the next question now um, and it's with regard to equitable practices with regard to recruitment recruitment, promotion, and, and retention policies. So how do each of your respective companies or organizations apply such equitable, equitable practices? Does anyone want to go? <laughs> I can always go. <laughs> <laughs> um, we put something neat into practice when we are recruiting, and um, it's working really, really well. We've been doing it for a few years now. But we have DE&I champions that are part of the interview um, phase also vetting all of our resumes to make sure that we're not excluding based on if your telephone number begins with a different area code or mm -hmm. naming um, or if all of your experience is not Canadian based things like this and then these individuals also sit in the interviews to make sure that everyone in the room is looking at full picture we're not excluding anyone we're looking at talent um, and we're, we're kind of taking the fit um, word and throwing that away. It's all about if you have the skills to do the job, regardless of how you know the CV may, might present, or if names are not, you know, something that you're used to saying, or whatever the case may be. So these champions are, are pivotal in us making sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is in the forefront, and that we have a very, very strong workforce. So that's that's been key in the last few years. Uh, just to chime in, so something similar to uh, what Cisco yes. does is yeah. um, as we go through our rounds of interviews at RBC, um, if it's three or four rounds, it's never the same person who's interviewing at each level. So it helps make sure that, you know, if one person was biased towards one person, mm -hmm. it's not carrying forward onto round two, three, and four. It's different individuals that are interviewing different people at different stages. And um, having similar concept of people that represent different groups as part of that um, also helps. There's a quote that I heard once, and it, it was about diversity and inclusion. It was um, diversity is is being invited to the party. Mm -hmm. um, that's your your interviews and being given the job. The inclusion part is did they play your music? Did they give you an opportunity to dance and ask you to dance? So once you've hired. Um, you know, a diverse community. It's what else are you also doing within your organization to make sure that they have those opportunities to participate, have those opportunities to grow as well. 
Yeah, Thank that's you. Great. Thanks, Alex. So I'll focus on the retention. And much like Cisco, we do stay interviews or retention interviews, but with more of a focus on indigenous trades and indigenous employees that we have. So with Pentagon, we're a construction organization predominantly. Uh, we go where the work is, and often the work is in very isolated, very rural places mm -hmm. that are often quite adjacent to indigenous communities. So we very much try to get engaged with the communities again, see the barriers, talk about them, listen predominantly, and go through the challenges one by one. But on the retention side, uh, we've really started to incorporate having, once we get fully staffed up on our projects, speaking to our indigenous trades, mm -hmm. seeing what's working, seeing what's not, and then hopefully actioning thereafter what is not working and really listening and being involved with the practices that they want to see on site. That's great. And that's a little bit of a lead up into our next question, which is with regard to indigenous populations and what you got your organizations are doing to, uh, to make your spaces more welcoming to indigenous uh, peoples. Anyone wants to speak to that? Okay, me again. <laughs> so um, several things on that front, um, in addition to, uh, like I said, we've already have several partnerships with indigenous groups, but uh, for, we also have like, um, revamped all of our corporate policies and stuff. We have an orientation and an onboarding, a whole new onboarding thing when people come on board. Um, there's a mentorship program with employees within working in the same group, crossovers and different divisions. So you get to have a full sharing. And we also have, which is really special, we have um, a sharing of different cultures. So they get to experience everyone else's cultures. Newfoundland has very diverse ver diversity in its own culture in itself. So we have a lot of those events and sharing days. Um, so that really works well. But in particular, we do a mentor program. We help with English programs too and in housing. And we do reach out and we use a lot of um, uh, Dr. Fang from Memorial University. We use Memorial University a lot in a lot of our trainings. And um, even when we're doing our interviewing process, if there's a language barrier, that's usually our place to go for uh, you know, the, the, lang the language situation, but uh, we collaborate, because we, like Pennycom, we're out in, in a lot of rural areas. We collaborate with the communities, the community groups. They're volunteer organizations that are in that area. We find out what the people that we're bringing into our, to our province are interested in, what their families are looking for. We try to partner them then up with groups whether it be church groups or the Lions or the Legions or what organizations that may be in those groups. And we do partnerships there. We encourage that and we do a lot of sponsorship. If they have young children, we'll probably sponsor a, you know, a soccer team or a football mm -hmm. or whatever they're interested in. We want to get them out in the community and to be accepted in the community. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that going around and, and that happens in Newfoundland unbeknownst to anybody even knowing about it. Mm -hmm. But when you put them in rural Newfoundland, because we have our own language barriers, like the Looney and the Tooney situation, um, we ask our, um, we go out to the community, the businesses in the community, we ask them to put up signage. If it's a language barrier, uh, you know, maybe they speak Philippine, and then we'll ask them to put signs up, simple signs, walking, maybe this is $2, $3, whatever it is, and then eventually the signs can come down in two or three years and just, it's just a really good, they feel welcome, they want to come back. We have a really good retention policy when our, when our temporary foreign workers and they want, what can we do to keep them here all year round? Can we, we, we want a job, we want to stay, we want to settle. Mm -hmm. And um, we found our onboarding and our mentor program mm -hmm. very, very successful. Excellent, thank you. Does anyone else want to add to that at all? Do we have Khalid? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alex. The indigenous piece is most definitely uh, near and dear to my heart, but it is an organizational philosophy for Pentagon as well. Uh, it really is one of our core values to engage and, again, listen. And we do that by showing up. Um, I think it's for indigenous relations that we've encountered. You can send an email, you can send or try a phone, but showing up. Uh, if that means me going from St. John's, Newfoundland, to uh, Fort Alexander, Manitoba, to Capus Casey in Ontario, to these very isolated kind of communities, so be it. Uh, we go there, we speak to the uh, elders, chiefs, uh, employment 
counselors within the area, again, talk about their barriers. We often host career fairs, talk about what the project is, what employment opportunities there are, take the resumes, have on-the-spot interviews. And we've begun to roll out on-the-job training programs as well. And we're going to start it very small. We're not going to try to conquer the world or take over everything so far, so to speak, but uh, partner get people interested in the trades, get people interested in engineering and staff positions, and if we can change one person's life, indigenous-wise, on a project, and not, not all of our projects are huge, right? Some are 50 people, some are hundreds, uh, but if we can change a couple lives on a project, and we could put in that seed of influence of construction, and getting into a, a really strong career, uh, we feel that's a, that's a start. Great community outreach and uh, presence. Yeah, Khalid, do you want to add to that? I, I think as a newcomer who, uh, of course, is ignorant about indigenous people uh, before I came, uh, uh, I think I benefited a lot from uh, the partnership that the ANC had with indigenous uh, um, uh, organizations uh, that resulted in uh, training programs. And, and you know, every time I, I see the email signature that we have that acknowledges the land, uh, I, it, it comes to my mind that um, 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 we have to respect the indigenous people and, and like we have to learn more about the ind indigenous people. Um, so I, I feel these partnerships and, and uh, maybe the small things that we do like the email signature or the land acknowledgement at the beginning of a meeting, I feel these are all important for uh, speaking here about myself as a newcomer, not only as a person, as a member of the ANC, I feel these are all important. And uh, um, um, uh, the the organization in general, uh, uh, the appreciation of the ANC to towards the uh, indigenous people, uh, is reflected on on us as newcomers as well. That's great. It's an excellent perspective as well. Thank you for that, colleague. I'm going to switch the, to the next question now, uh, which is focusing on racialized groups. So how are your organizations making spaces more inclusive for working members of racialized groups? And how are you challenging anti-black racism in, within your organizations? Would anyone like to go? I'll, I'll start Khaled this time. can start again. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, so uh, in our organization, as obviously we work with newcomers, uh, one of the things that I like is that uh, as, as, uh, as soon as you enter uh, our main buildings, you see pictures of uh, our clients, the, the newcomers uh, in the province. So this makes us feel that, yes, this, this place is for us, this place welcomes us, we are part of this uh, place. Um, so again, small things count and, and they, they, you know, when you put them together, they mean a lot to us. Would anybody else like to add to that? And similar to RBC, we have uh, colleague resource groups. So these uh, groups are, are colleague-led, they're volunteer-led, and they identify certain marginalized groups within our colleague base. And one of those um, is to support our black colleagues. And really, it's a space where we can come together and we can learn about history. We can also look forward on how we can be um, equitable in our practices. Um, and we also do some great celebrations, as, as we know, you know, it was Black History Month, and so we had some great teach-outs. So we carve out a lot of space. I think in workplaces you need to stop and pause and give all of your colleagues time to learn about the person that's sitting right next to them. And that's the, one of the pieces that I love about the colleague resource groups is we stop. We stop working and we come together and we learn from subject matter experts and we become more diverse and inclusive and knowledgeable because of it. So these groups are fantastic to infiltrate into companies. So there was a question that came up from the crowd on um, what the thoughts and opinions were on setting hiring quotas for certain uh, minority groups or equity groups. Um, in 2020, after the George Floyd uh, murder, RBC kind of shifted their focus on the unconscious biases and the, and the systematic biases that were, you know, known in organizations or, or unknown. And they took it really down to the ground level on, yes, we eventually want to have, you know, 30% in this category, 40% in this category, but what do we need to do at the bottom to actually work our way there? So they've 
actually start to divert resources towards scholarships for uh, black students right from high schools to universities and not only in the black community but even indig indigenous community and other people of color so they've taken it down to the grassroots level on what is it that we can do in to impact everyday lives of these communities so that we are reducing that systematic racism that we tend to see in organizations even though this is a focus for you know scholarships whether it be in university or high schools or different entrepreneurial programs and not directly linking into rbc employment it has a benefit in the overall economy and the integration of of black people within within canada it's not just focused in newfoundland or atlantic but it's across the country as well Excellent. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, we haven't spoken yet about people with varying abilities. So uh, my next and, and last question before we have a, a little bit of a Q&A session um, is what accessible practices have your organizations implemented to support people with varying abilities? Does anyone want to speak to that? Maybe I'll start with just the very micro level because when I got that question, I thought about just stuff. but. Uh, Recruitment practices have drastically changed since COVID. Uh, 2020 to 2024 uh, organizations, I could probably ask everyone here, how many of you have participated in a video interview? And probably most who are in the job market would put up their hands now. That wasn't the case in 2020 and before that point. I do strongly feel that video interviews are an accessibility feature that helps so many. Uh, you can put closed captioning on it. Uh, no longer with people with physical limitations will they have to have any nervousness about approaching an office. Is it accessible? Does it have a ramp? How am I able to be able to get there? People that who might be neurodiverse, who might have that more nervousness of this is an unfamiliar space to me, what does that mean? All you can do this from the comforts of your own home and I strongly think that to be comfortable in your own home or in an environment that you choose to have that interview, you can set up the stage to better per perform in the interview and when you better perform, I see that and I hopefully will hire that more often. So it's a, it's a more equal playing field for all. And also another great practice is to ask, um, ask in print and also ask verbally if there's any accommodation needed for the interview. Mm -hmm. um, that really sets the stage and they know that you're an inclusive workforce. Mm -hmm. And then when you do hire somebody, also ask about, you know, how do you learn and develop best? I think that if we bring everybody in and shuffle them through a training session, that's the same for everybody. We're missing the mark. So make sure that you're, you're running people through training programs that are different. If someone is more hands-on, give them hands-on learning. If someone likes to take literature home and read through it, if they're that owl in the group, give them the literature to take home. But be, be pliable. Don't be so rigid with your, your onboarding practices. And just to add to the point of asking people, um, one of the shifts that RBC has made is when coming up with action plans, it's not coming from the organization to the people, it's including the people in them providing information on what is it that they need to see, what is it that they need to have in terms of uh, accessibility and, and inclusion for anyone that identifies um, as having a disability. You know, oftentimes when it's, it's coming from in quotation marks, I'll put expert groups. It's more, you know, theoretically, you might run into this situation, so you must have X, Y, Z, but you really need to get that information from the people that are directly impacted, and that way you are making the adjustments that are necessary to better accommodate. Anyone else like to share anything before we do a Q&A? Yeah. Thank you. Um, we, we have a... Um, a wide variety of uh, employees work for us. We have um, several elderly, um, and one of the things like we do do the like we ask them how they learn and if it's more hands on or if it's books and stuff like that. Um, with our elderly, because um, we have a lot of older ladies actually now that I'm thinking of it, not a whole lot of men, and um, like we'll ask them like if 
they like because a lot of them are part time, some of them are full time. Um, but we will ask, like, what kind of schedule can we do for you? Is there anything that we need to modify uh, to be able to get you to um, work as many hours as you want and, and stuff like that? Like, we'll modify their duties if there's certain things that they can't do. Um, and we'll also adjust, like, breaks if they need to have more uh, breaks in order to be able to um, continue on the floor because, I mean, Let's face it, we are on our feet, like our entire shifts, like our few minutes that we get for breaks. Um, it's not an easy job to do, and it is always welcoming to have our, our, our elderly workers with us. Um, and we try to make it as comforting as possible for them. And we do, like, say, we have an open door policy, like, if you need anything, like, just make sure you just come out back and have a chat with us, and we'll do whatever we can to make it more comfortable for them to be able to continue working with us for as long as they can and we've had a nice few retire with us and, and it's always nice to see them to go out on their own like that right and we don't have a big party and stuff like that for them but um, yeah lots of timbits lots of coffee uh, but it's always fun to be able to celebrate their little milestones with them so that's one of the, the ones that I love I actually have a lady that's about to retire from me now and she's worked with me my entire 25 years and I actually can't say anymore because I'll probably start to cry because <laughs> she's one of my favorites but yeah that's what I do mm, that's so nice Is, uh, any final thoughts anyone wants to share that's a nice note to end on if unless anyone has any final thoughts and we'll start a Q&A session if anyone has any questions at all I don't know if there's a microphone out there yes there is if anyone has any Q&A yeah test 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 Hi, I'm Leah Farrell. I'm the advocacy manager from the Autism Society, and I was going to ask about um, your disability policy. So I appreciate the last question, and I appreciate your answers because I feel like all of us in the room really need to move away from the narrative that um, employing and retaining disabled uh, workers is a challenge or is difficult. If we just meet people where, where they're at, we can um, accommodate them accordingly. And the narrative can really play into the fact that a lot of disabled, including the autistic and neurodivergent population, are underemployed and unemployed. So um, if we're really talking about our DEI, we need to make sure that we are centering the voices of the disability community within that as well. So I really appreciate um, what you all shared about accommodations and ensuring that disabled individuals are listened to. The, the, the very simple thing of asking um, and we can see that the, the simple act of uh, video meetings, again, I, I agree with you, it's an accessibility tool for sure. Um, and it's just a really important topic and one that I appreciate was brought up. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I there's someone over here. Where are you? I'm Laura Bell. In the white and, and black. Hi, Laura Bell here. I had a quick question that relates a little bit to um, Dr. Fang's um, presentation earlier. So when you were talking about um, advocating for disability rights when it comes to supporting employees, when he mentioned, it, I'm talking about the intersectionality of racialized folks with disabilities. When we look at the population within our province and we have like labor shortages, there seems to be a gap between employers advocating on behalf of racialized individuals with disabilities because accessing immigration into Canada, if you are racialized, it's hard enough. If you have a disability, there is another step in trying to get into Canada when you are do have the ability to work with um, some adjustments being made. Do you, any of your organizations, advocate on that intersection of racial identity and disability within immigration? Yes, <laughs> so we've um, struggled on a couple of fronts with that, with the regulations and the authorities, I guess, and us trying to bring in some people into uh, Newfoundland and Labrador to work. Um, we've had some successes, and, um, but we've had some failures as well. Um, extremely disappointing from, from our perspective uh, from a company, because um, ultimately, um, as long as you provide a safe, caring, and a kind workplace for all involved, it benefits the workers and it benefits the employers. And it's a win-win situation. And when you can get everybody on that same playing field, you'll have nothing but benefits for all. Um, unfortunately, um, that's not the case a lot when it's the immigration issue, because what it comes down to or what we have found in the past, 
the struggle that we face with is that um, they're, it's the fear that they're going to end up in a medical situation and um, now it becomes at the cost of the taxpayers. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit as well as an immigration lawyer. The le legislation is that, you know, you can be medically inadmissible to Canada if you're trying to immigrate as an economic immigrant um, based on a medical that you have to perform as part of your application process. Um, and there's been a lot of changes to the, le to, like, the, le the case law actually on that recently. Uh, like they've, uh, they've made concessions for people who have autism, um, and it's, uh, it's actually like a cost analysis that they do, and the, there's an average cost spend per person in Canada, which is around the $22,000 mark. That's like the number that IRCC gives uh, for the assessment. And if there's a, like a, a fear, I guess, on the immigration side, uh, for lack of a better word, that the cost for this person's, whether it's social services or medical services, is going to out is going to go beyond that number, that 20, I think it's 22 or 26,000, something around there per year, then they will deny the permanent residency application based on medical inadmissibility. Uh, now there's uh, procedural fairness letters, there's all kinds of legal things you can do to try to negate that with, um, uh, you know, coming up with plans and things like that. But, uh, and if you have money to, to kind of negate that, like there are things you can do. Um, they're way less strict than they used to be. Uh, about 15 years, 10, 15 years ago when I first started practicing immigration law. But uh, yeah, it's a huge barrier. Uh, and uh, lawyers across the country are arguing that it's actually a human rights issue. Uh, so it's going possibly to the Supreme Court at some point. Um, but we'll see what happens with that. But it is, it is like a massive area of immigration law that is a, you know, is a huge barrier for people with disabilities. And even if your child, like if you're, even if your child is medically inadmissible, it makes the whole family inadmissible. Everybody's got to get a medical. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. So as a company, we have challenged that and won. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can challenge it. Um, and, but it's a, it's a whole process, right? Because it's a procedural fairness it process. process. Yeah. It took us It'll delay the application by years. Two years. Yeah. This is not specific to the, you know, group with disabilities, but just on the, on the, you know, immigrant side of it. When I moved to Canada in 2010, you know, graduated in 2013, trying to work towards my permanent residency was a challenge because there weren't so many channels, you know, now we have the provincial nominee, now we have express entry, now we have the AIP. Uh, when I was going through it, they weren't all there. So one of the questions that you know, immigration paperwork would ask for my employer to say is why they have hired you over a Canadian, which kind of goes against your human rights, right? At the end of the day, you want to hire whoever had the best uh, skills and opportunities to fulfill that job, regardless of nationality or immigration status. So I think, you know, people bringing that up has led to other channels um, coming up for immigration, but some channels still have that question and it baffles me why it's still there. You know, we talk so much on the need for immigration, we talk so much for the need of, of, of that population growth, and yet there are still some of those barriers that are there for people. So sometimes now you find, you know, Dr. Um, Tony spoke about the retention rate in Newfoundland is low you know, we've got so many immigrants coming in, but then we also have so many leaving because they can't fulfill all those tick boxes that are required by, you know, whether it's provincial or federal. Here in Newfoundland, they move to other provinces that, that don't ask those specific questions to employers on why they hired an immigrant as opposed to a Canadian resident. So I think the more that companies fight back uh, and show that there's no need to ask those specific questions, then our, our legislations will also change to to accommodate that better. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question uh, from our email. This question is from Abraham. Paratransit is often a barrier for disabled workers. Even if the workplace is fully accessible, getting to work is a barrier to a disabled person who might be fully qualified otherwise. What are we doing to reach these folks? Sorry about that. Um, we'd allow for flexibility. And in addition to that, um, in some cases, I know two within our company, that we actually provide the transportation ourselves at our cost. 
Uh, we've also had a few um, that use the go bus and we accommodate the schedule for them so that they can work around it and they just tell us what their schedule is and then they arrange the go bus. We, we have had quite a few that have used that with their uh, disability. Thank you. There's, a, there's another person right here that in the black yes. place that's had a, a hand up a couple times. Hey, yeah. John. <laughs> yeah. You oh, you're good. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, morning here. I'm just thinking about a few things, actually. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, really, at the same time, but uh, maybe it's a food for thought scenario. I don't know if it applies to anybody directly, but just speaking about uh, my life experience as a deaf individual, like I'm talking about employment and a client perspective from your perspective, but I'm just wondering, um, I, I'm not uh, specifically talking about a banking company, it's just kind of a general comma personally, with regards to a bank scenario though, as an example. When I'm signing a contract or a waiver, I have to, so, so if I have to sign something like a, a document, you know, I, it is possible that if I sign it without an interpreter that there might be a misunderstanding. But really I could, you know, without that, with a communication barrier there written in an English document, that we could have uh, a miscommunication and a suit issue. The second point on that contractual situation, not having the clear accommodation, um, many reasons that we're not hired as a deaf individual is because we're deaf. There are some employers that refuse to hire interpreters in the interview process given that language barriers so that the application process and that interview really we, we don't even get that opportunity to get to the table and that happens more often than not. So we don't even get the opportunity to sit at the table. Um, the application, uh, the applicant doesn't get that same service uh, that they may have as an acquired deaf individual. And the boss says that, no, you can't, you're not qualified. Sorry, anybody who works at Starbucks or loves Starbucks. I'm a Tim Hortons guy myself. <laughs> but it's the same kind of experience, you know, when it comes to that double double. You go to the go through the drive-through. There's the barrier, right? It's the drive-through on a speaker. We have to park, walk in, order, you know, but that convenience of a drive through is already a barrier. The plan perhaps to, you know, become more deaf friendly like in a, in a Tim Hortons or a Starbucks issue, you know, is that it were depending on that art, uh, uh, audio visual, we have, uh, you know, some maybe some lip reading. We have like deaf and hard of hearing people with a variety of whether it's not only just pure sign language. There's a variety of accommodations that can be uh, accommodated for a variety of members in the deaf community, not only just deaf that cannot hear. So we've got the hard of hearing community as well. So that's a little bit of food for thought thought on those three points. I don't know really if it's a question. I just want to say something there because we have a regular at one of our Tim Hortons locations and he is deaf. Um, and we have cameras that actually look at our speakers because most of us have double drive throughs so we need to know uh, who, got ha who has to go first. Um, but that regular, he's seriously in two or three times a day, but when we see his car at the speaker, we actually know um, and he drives on through and he comes up and at first he used to have a piece of paper with his order on it but now all we have to do is see his car and we actually have the coffee ready for him and he has multiple drinks so um, <laughs> once we get to know the the car and the person most times um, that barrier isn't something that we we actually have we actually enjoy it <laughs> and I'll add to that so the gentleman that's probably delivering your food yes is also deaf. Um, one of our best drivers at Cisco is hearing impaired. 
Um, and when he came to us, of course, a lot of people would um, put up barriers so that interview wouldn't have happened, but it did. And he's been with us for a long, long time. And he's awesome. And he's awesome. <laughs> a client can say. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's up to everybody in the room. You know, do not marginalize people. If you have someone coming that wants a job, do everything that you can to have an honest conversation with them because you'll, you'll be stronger as a company for it. So I think conversations like this really spearhead change. And just like Tim Hortons, when they see that, a, that person come in for their three or four coffees, <laughs> or the driver that's at the back, um, we need to make these things happen because it's the right thing to do. I think sometimes organizations look at accommodation um, as, as, a, as a big expense and are not necessarily willing to incur it. But I, you know, I do urge organizations that, you know, look at what works for you. I'll speak from a banking perspective. Um, you know, we're across the country. We have multiple banks uh, in, 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 in the province in Newfoundland. In St. John's, we don't have one branch that has translators for every language or even, uh, you know, the blind or deaf community. But we do have access to interpreters. Um, we use a, a third party company who has access to 237 languages, including ASL, and then we also have up to 32 languages that will offer that uh, visual uh, video conference as well. So if ever we're dealing with a client uh, or employee who needs that translation for legal purposes, like you said, uh, it's easily accessible, not a physical person in the location, but we have a resource that we can turn to to make sure that no one is turned away because of um, English barrier or or any disabilities that are there. Even our you know our ATMs have been adjusted to accommodate um, uh, visual barriers. I'm not to, I'm not too sure on the deaf community on what our ATMs have. Um, actually not the deaf, sorry, the blind, uh, they do have the option to plug in like headphones so you can actually be, you know, walked through the process of, you know, depositing money, withdrawing money. So again, it comes from engaging people that are impacted in the community to make those adjustments that need to be made. But again, thank you for your feedback. I think each uh, of the minority groups uh, in this province will, will feel that you spoke for them today. Uh, because like we each, like Lauren said uh, previously, we each have like something that may deter us to get the job interview when we are a little bit different. Uh, but we are losing a lot, we are missing out on a lot of potential when, when we do this. So, um, so I, I, I'll go back to Lauren's point that sometimes we have to be open to um, accepting uh, whoever I am and like however I look and whatever is with like me because like there it, there must be some potential that I can contribute to the workplace that maybe for some reason the HR person might miss or because because this person is different. I think that's that yeah. Yes, uh, I'm sorry to have to move us along. We're still catching up where we had the fire alarm. So if your question didn't get uh, answered, please send us an email with your question and we'll work to get that question answered for you. So now let's say thank you to all of our lovely guests for that wonderful discussion. That was awesome, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for moderating. Uh, next up. We're going to have our lunch break and another performance. But before we do that, I want to uh, make sure we're all aware that uh, the Amera Center has set up a prayer room uh, for anyone who would like to avail of that. That is in room B1007. So that is a prayer room there if you need it. Now, our next performance is the Brazilian musical duo, Anna and Eric. So they're gonna get set up, and as they get set up, lunch has been out there waiting for us. So we, you know, feel free to go get it and come back and watch the show. Uh, I'm gonna say some words about Anna and Eric as we get into it. Anna and Eric Ramos are a Brazilian duo based in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Having performed in Brazil, Europe, and Canada, Anna and Eric offer a unique combination of Brazilian bossa nova 
and North American indie folk. In 2020, the duo released two singles, Hope and Lights My Way, as well as their self-titled debut EP, earning them one nomination at the 2021 ECMA Awards and three at the 2021 Music and L Awards. In 2023, the duo released their debut album, Our House From Here, and the singles, I Can See Our House From Here, and Amenha de Abril, April Morning, which have received wide coverage in Brazil, Portugal, and Canada. The album was nominated as the 2024 Global Recording of the Year at the ECMA Awards and received three uh, 2023 Music Canal Award nominations. So, go ahead on and get yourself some lunch, take your restroom break, and uh, mingle a bit, and enjoy the musical entertainment. Thank you. Look 
so much such a pleasure being here today with you sorry that we are bothering your lunch uh, but can you hear us yeah oh that's good then yeah <laughs> very good so we just played Dias que não tem mais fim or days that have no end um, and we're playing now hope He joined the sun and the sea He was the prettiest twilight That we found eternally And now the future is bad And our best years have passed Son, I have grown so old But he's the same Look at that There's a smile As a solo artist, I also have a project under my name, Ana Luisa Ramos. Uh, so we're going to perform the song for you. It's called Clouds. Okay. I could touch the clouds. Sim, 
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So this was clouds. I think that each table has a coaster with our links. So if you're enjoying, uh, make sure to follow us and to listen to us everywhere. Right? Exactly. Tables are big, so you may have to look for the coaster, but it is there. Yeah, it's there, yeah. Um, I think that we're doing now a, a cover. Uh, there's a song that we love to perform, and it's called I Wish You Love. So folks, someone left their phone. Okay, we just found it. So we're playing now Sao Azul or Blue Sky. 
It's from my second album called, uh, called Amanheceu.
thank you so much. We're Anna and Eric. Uh, such a pleasure to be able to perform again uh, the ideas. We thank a lot the ANC for all what you do. We really appreciate. Um, and we're playing our last song. It's called Lights My Way. Thank you very much. Thank Hope you. you all have a great afternoon. Thank you.